that's the Peanuts uh, from their 1959 debut album, uh, Kawaii Peanuts. Uh, the song is Arukoi no Monogatari, a cover version of Historia de un Amor by the Panamanian composer Carlos Eleta Almaran. Uh, as you could probably hear, the Peanuts version, the, in, in their version, the lyrics alternate between Japanese and Spanish. Um, that's very common in, in uh, their, their recordings. As I'm sure most of you know, the Peanuts were a singing duo comprised of twin sisters, Ito Eme, Emi and Ito Yumi. They're best known in the, the West for their recurring role in the Mothra movies. They played the two little fairies that show up in, in all of the Mothra movies. Um, with the Peanuts, we can draw the first connection to migration, domestic migration. Um, the massive influx of millions of young rural people to urban centers in Japan during the 1950s and 60s was accompanied by the rise of a new ecology of mass culture. Television replaced cinema as the dominant visual culture, and pre-recorded popular music emerged as the preeminent form of youth culture. The Peanuts were central to this new ecology of popular culture. Managed by Watanabe Productions, they debuted in 1959 at the age of 18 and soon became regulars on the Japanese pop music charts with their striking sibling harmonies. The Peanuts released 76 singles between 1959 and their retirement in 1975, and they sold tens of millions of records during that period. They also, at the same time, became stars on the new medium of television. They were regularly featured performers on a number of popular television programs, in particular the massively popular Shabon Dama Holiday or Soap Bubble Holiday that aired every Sunday night on the Nippon Television Network between 1961 and 1972. The Peanuts repertoire consisted of easy listening mainstream pop songs. They included many translated cover versions of Anglo-American hits. But what strikes me as particularly interesting about their music is that the way that they cultivated an image that was closely connected with Latin America and with continental Europe, especially France, Germany, and Italy. And here we're entering into the third sense of migration, the cultures of migration. The Peanuts recorded many cover versions of South American, French, Italian, and German pop songs, often singing lyrics at least partially in the original language. Even when they recorded original numbers that were composed for them by Japanese uh, songwriters, uh, those numbers often conveyed, both in the lyrics and in the music, a continental European or Latin flair. Their album titles often referred to Europe, for example, the 1971 album, The Glorious Sound of Francis Lai, which was a tribute to the French chanson composer, or their 1965 uh, hit album, uh, album, Hit Parade Volume 6, Around the Europe. As I don't know if you can see uh, well here, but on their record jackets, uh, almost always the song titles are given in Japanese and then a non-English -European, non European language. They did this for both cover versions of European songs, but also for songs created domestically. Um, moreover, the Peanuts also frequently visited Europe to perform concerts, to appear on television, and to have recording sessions there. They themselves, in other words, became cultural migrants, or it's probably more precise to say expats. Uh, their recordings were marketed on the continent and apparently received, uh, reached a, a fair degree of popularity, especially in West Germany and Italy. And you can see some of their German releases here in the slide. Um, probably the best known number by the Peanuts is their 1963 smash hit, Coi no Vacances, or Vacances de l'Amour. Uh, Vacances de l'Amour won a Japan Record Award for its composer, Miyagawa Hiroshi, who was the primary producer and arranger of the Peanuts music. The lyrics by Iwaki, uh, Iwatani Tokiko are all in Japanese, except, of course, for that key word, vacance, uh, that's used in the title and also in the refrain of the chorus. The popularity of this song helped vacance become a buzzword uh, in 1960s uh, Japan. Uh, let me play a little clip from the song. I will apologize in advance that you're going to have this song going through your brain for the rest of the day. <laughs> I'm not 
Well, after the song became a massive hit for the Peanuts in Japan, it migrated overseas. A cover version of Coin of Accounts was released in 1963 in Italy by the singer Caterina Valente and enjoyed success in the European charts. And then, amazingly, in 1965, a Russian language version was recorded in the Soviet Union by Nina Panteliva uh, and became a massive hit. And apparently, the song is still today uh, a standard number uh, in, in Russia. Here's a little bit of what it sounds like in Russian. <laughs> In addition to their connections to Europe, the Peanuts are also well remembered for their Latin sound, in, in particular for translated cover versions of South American, Central American, and Caribbean popular hits. Uh, this tendency began from the very start of their career. The Peanuts would, recover, would record covers of, among, among, of, among other songs, Kizas, 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 which we know in English is perhaps, 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 La Novia, Magica Luna, Quien Sera, Moliendo Café, and many others. So what should we make of this cultural migration into and out from Japanese pop during the 1960s? I think it gives evidence of a powerful desire for cosmopolitanism inside and outside of Japan. But we have to also acknowledge that this cultural migration took place only along certain routes. Uh, the Peanuts frequently invoke European and Latin music in their recordings, but they're much less prone to make musical connections to Africa or the rest of Asia. Uh, and likewise, they and their songs travel to Europe, the Soviet Union, and the Americas, but not to Africa or Asia. No doubt this has something to do with 1960s trends in fashion, film, and other domains in which France, Italy, and Germany in particularly enjoyed a privileged status. I think the Peanuts Cosmopolitan produces a kind of high status brand image to their sound. It lends an air of cultural sophistication that clearly sold very well on the market. It was a kind of commodity branding. Uh, Michael Fermanovsky argues that the Peanuts were crucial figures in the introduction of a new Paris-centric, upper-middle-class fashion look in early 1960s Japan. So one strain of cultural migration here then exists at the, the level of commodity culture. And pop songs were, of course, among other things, commodities. And yet part of the reasons that the, the Peanuts recordings sold well is that they spoke to real desires that existed in Japan for a certain kind of continental lifestyle one that was associated with commodity consumption, but also, I think, with relative autonomy within the Cold War global order. The desirability of sounding like French pop music, for example, seems in part linked up with the desire to be more like France, to occupy a less subservient role vis-a-vis -vis the United States in global geopolitics. And it's important to remember that in 1966, at the peak of the Peanuts popularity, France withdrew its armed forces from NATO. So one of the things I think that I tended to overlook in my book was the degree to which Japanese culture during the Cold War, in both elite and non-elite forms of music, demonstrated a powerful desire for non-alignment, for a position that was outside the dominant binaries of the Cold War. So I think we have to think about another 1955 system. 1955 was, after all, also the year of the Bandung Conference. Japan was one of the 29 mostly Asian and African countries that sent official delegations to the conference in Bandung. The conference, as is well known, was an early effort to respond to the Cold War division of the world between the American and Soviet blocs by creating a third force, what would eventually come to be called the non-aligned movement. Japan's participation in Bandung was in many ways incoherent. Uh, whereas Bandung was intended to form an alliance among nations that were undergoing decolonization, Japan participated as a former imperial power. As, and as Christine Dennehy has noted, its delegation included several figures who had played key bureaucratic roles in Japan's pre-1945 empire. But the decision to participate in Bandung suggests the existence of a desire for non-alignment across the political spectrum in Japan, both in the state and in civil society. 
It's also important to note that 1955 is also the year that the Japan Communist Party threw out its Zainichi members, its ethnically Korean members. They were supposed to align with the Communist Party of North Korea, not the Communist Party of Japan. This is also part of the Bandung moment. In the stress on decolonization and national independence, the movement was driven by the idea that there was a necessary relationship between a given community of people and a specific bounded territory, a, a, a relationship that found its proper expression in the establishment of a sovereign na nation state. The Bandung movement had a really hard time dealing with people who complicated this formula. And here I've learned a lot from Nicholas Lambrecht, who's a University of Chicago graduate student working on this problem. Bandung, for instance, had a very hard time dealing with or recognizing dual citizenship. Or, or, or to bring things back to our conference, migration. People who lived in one territory but were said to belong to another territory. Uh, by 1955, for example, the newly sovereign states of India and China both reversed course and ended the policy of offering automatic citizenship and a right of return to overseas ethnically Indian and Chinese communities that were scattered across the, the globe. Dipesh Chakrabarty has written about the tension between what he calls the pedagogical and the dialogical aspects of the Bandung spirit. This points to one of the enduring tensions at the heart of the Bandung spirit. It presumes a developmentalism centered on the nation state form, which is itself one of the legacies of global imperialism. This is what made that migration such a difficult topic for the Bandung movement to deal with. Uh, after 1945, uh, under U.S. pressure, uh, the Japanese sta state backed away from Bandung. Uh, but Japanese intellectuals and cultural producers continued to look to the movement. Japanese writers participated in the 1958 Tashkent meeting of the Afro-Asian Writers Union. Uh, the Japanese state tried to prevent them from going, but a number of writers did go. Uh, and then uh, writers in Japan hosted a 1961 emergency meeting of the Afro-Asian Writers Union, again in the face of opposition from the Japanese state. That 1961 meeting in Tokyo was held in the wake of the massive 1960 Anpo protests in Japan against the renewal of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And the participants in the meeting all see the Anpo protests as being part of the Bandung movement. I think I and other scholars up till now have focused too much on what the Ampo, 1960 Ampo demonstrations were against. They were against the U.S.-Japan security relationship. And I think it's important for us now to look also at what the Ampo demonstrations were in favor of. Uh, they were for what was called at the time neutralism, but what would increasingly through the 1960s be called non-alignment or third worldism. Nakano Shigehado spoke at the 1961 emergency meeting in Tokyo. Uh, he told the delegates, uh, since our meeting in Tashkent, the situation in Asia and Africa has seen remarkable dramatic change and development. Last year alone in Africa, 17 new independent nations were born. And in April of this year, Sierra Leone is supposed to obtain its independence. Victory for the people of Algeria is surely near as well. These, the changes in development in Asia have been no less striking. They include the revolutionary uprising by the people of South Korea and the great struggle of the Japanese people in opposition to the U.S.-Japan military alliance. And so you can see Nakano Shigehado is clearly putting Ampo in the context of Bandung and the non-aligned movement. Um, I, I do want to point out that this is surely the first time in history that Nakano Shigehado and the Peanuts have been quoted together in an academic paper. I should get some bonus points for that. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that there was widespread support throughout the Cold War period in Japan on both the cultural left and in mainstream mass culture for non-alignment. In other words, at the very moment that the dominant 1955 system was taking shape and Japan was taking up its Cold War position as a U.S. client state, there was a counter movement among intellectuals and cultural producers that tried to position Japan as a non-aligned country, one that sided neither with the United States nor the Soviet Union in the Cold War. My hypothesis is that even in the most commodified branches of popular music in Japan during the Cold War, we can hear the traces of a utopian desire to escape the binaries of the Cold War that linked Japan as a client state of the United States in opposition to the Soviet bloc. The cosmopolitan music of the Peanuts then re represents an attempt to imagine what it might sound like if Japan was not a client state. This vision enabled a range of cultural migrations into and out of Japan. The Peanuts could sing Latin pops, and Germans, Italians, and Russians could sing the Peanuts songs. In song, Japan could imagine itself as non-aligned, as a carrier of the Bandung spirit. But seemingly one condition of possibility for this vision of Japan was the negation of the possibility of transna transnational migration. Transnational migration had to re remain an unsung possibility. 
Thank you very much. Is there a way to change this so that it mirrors instead of? Actually, I should do this one. OK, sorry about that. Um, so thank you to the Teresaki Center, thank you to other presenters, um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. So the title for this talk comes from a conversation I had with Michael Emmerich in October of last year, where we were talking about how difficult it is to convince commercial publishers to include footnotes, appendices, and other technical apparatus to translations of Japanese fiction. So when I thought about what to present here at this global forum, at first I thought that I would be presenting a polemic about how great footnotes are, how we should have more of them in translations, and that the desire to have a translation without any notes is a bad form of perverse or reverse fetishism. But as often happens when actually writing talks, this talk turned into something else as I was writing it. And um, this is reflected in the fact that the talk doesn't really condense into a single point or argument, but is more of a speculative thought experiment, to borrow Michael's phrasing, about what a reflection on footnotes and more broadly the technical apparatus of translation can do to set in motion a conversation about cultures of migration. So the ongoing commercial opposition to footnotes and other technical apparatus and translations of Japanese fiction seems particularly misguided in our present moment, where contemporary Japanese American writers seem to be reveling in the uses of footnotes and appendices as literary devices in the service of their fictions. Take, for example, Ruth Ozeki's recently published and multiple award-winning novel, A Tale for the Time Being. Footnotes appear on the very first page of the text, translator's notes, three of them. And these are footnotes from a translator who seems happy to take liberties with the original text, translating the four-character compound Chosan Lishi with the slightly unusual choice of Dick and Jane. Here's quoting the footnote. Um, Cho San Li Shi, literally third son of Zhang and fourth son of Li, an idiom meaning any ordinary person. I have translated this as any Dick or Jane, but it could well be any Tom, Dick, or Harry. Um, so the question that's raised by the aggressive use of, or the assertive use of I as I translated is the question that might arise of who this I is. This is a neutral or non-aligned position any Dick or Jane that could do this kind of translation, or a specific person with specific characteristics, is the translator I the same as the author I, the Ruth Ozeki I of the novel. So in addition to this note, I also want to draw attention to the other technical apparatus on this first page, which is the wave motif at the very top underneath the part one symbol. 
motif of the wave also gives us a hint as to the movement of the novel as a whole, in which a writer named Ruth finds a diary written by a Japanese teenager named Nao that's been washed up on the shore of a remote Canadian island. This diary, Ruth will later speculate, has been carried by the Pacific Gyre from the coast of Japan to the coast of British Columbia. The North Pacific Gyre gives a tale for the time being an odd form of periodicity, where texts and objects go into the gyre as floating debris, becoming invisible from the shore, joining the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Dump, only to be spun free and land on the shore again in a moment of visibility or readability, in a way that's both mappable, but still a chaotic process of casting away, floating, submerging, and washing ashore. The Pacific Gyre suggests, I would hope, another way of thinking about the topography of migration or the ways that we might write histories of literary migration, not a, based upon a ter terrestrial division of firm boundaries or borders between lines and fields, but upon maritime currents, that is, the weird and odd periodicities that occur when we think about this kind of motif of the gyre that spins things out of the Pacific um, in temporalities that are mappable, but also quite random and unpredictable in other ways. Uh, and here, I think we might find inspiration in the experiments of the cultural historian Jordan Sand, whose 2009 essay in Representations uses a method of um, what he calls historical montage to juxtapose fragments of Trans-Pacific history around the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1908. And here's an image that's drawn from that article that attempts to map both individual cultural commodity movements along with other kinds of currents that occur within this period. Now, Many in this audience are familiar with, or indeed have written, I'm staring right at Rob Wilson in front of me, about uh, how the Pacific or Oceanic should reframe our methods of writing literary history. And here I'd like to add to this conversation by thinking about what the Pacific does to discourses of fetish, commodity fetishism, and translation. And to do this, I wanna draw your attention to the maritime metaphors of floating and flowing, flowing that appear in Laura Mulvey's 2002 introduction to the second edition of her um, 1995 book, Fetishism and Curiosity. So here, um, she writes about a pivotal moment reflecting on 1995. She says that 1995 now in retrospect seems a pivot point at which the critical centrality of materialism, that is the materialism of the film object, so critical for the concept of fetishism would itself be displaced in the past. This is true because fi as finance capitalists flourished, there's something about a free-floating signifier that may itself be a signifier of changes in the economic base. And for Laura Mulvey, this is for her response to what she calls the dematerialization of the industrial working class in the United Kingdom, a kind of Pacific turn of commodity production that moves to Asia in the reconfiguration of capitalism under globalization and creates what she calls a tidal wave of change brought by the digital age that is, of course, generating new cults of things, think of the iPod, for instance, that dramatize a new geography of global capitalism and a new topography of technology. Um, this creates an interesting juxtaposition between the 1995 Mulvey and the 2002 Mulvey with respect to the idea of how one thinks about fetishism and its move to theory in the, the question of how one turns to the materialism of film. So here is Mulvey in 1995. The process of disavowal, according to Freud, and estrangement, according to Marx, produces an overvaluation of things. And this overvaluation overflows or flows onto and affects an aesthetic and semiotic of things. In her 2002 introduction, Mulvey talks about this kind of overflowing from fetishism into theory through the work of Kristen Metz, saying, quote, as Kristen Metz points out, the film fetishist and the film theorist are two sides of the same coin. The film fetishist's pleasure in technology, his or her film buff accumulation of expertise, tips over into the domain of theory. And here, she's quoting Metz, is revealed the specific movement of theory when it shifts from a fascination with the equipment, that is the apparatus, to a study of the different codes that this equipment authorizes. Now, this is going to get a little weird. I'm going to draw Mulvey's title metaphors or metaphors of flowing and floating to Michael Emmerich's um, motif of the same idea in his recent work, The Tale of Genji, Translation, Canonization, and World Literature. And I just point out here at the level of metaphor that um, Emmerich also has a way of thinking about uh, theory in terms of waves or washing over. Here is a quotation about the position of the Japanese studies scholar that occupies the peculiar both but neither position that we occupy at the edge of the English department, washed by its waves of theory, and in my case, and I would suppose many of the cases of people in this room, at the edge of Japanese literary studies in Japan, washed by its waves of applied archival work. 
which creates a, a kind of, I think, resonant metaphor of thinking about um, the work of translation and the work of scholarship lying in a tidal pool somehow fed by two vast oceans. Similarly, there's a, another kind of um, metaphor of overflow that seems to exist within this idea of the tidal pool as being uh, washed over and over by two separate oceans or currents, um, which is that translation is in fact more than theoretical. It exceeds the theoretical, it overflows the theoretical, I'd argue, is a particularly intense form of research, a stream of the best sort of applied work, detailed practice gushing over the puddles and sands of settled theories, sweeping them into new alignments and configurations. So I wanna think about overvaluing the footnote or the technical apparatus of what surrounds the literary object. I wanna read it as if it were a film that accumulates scars, debris, things that occur in the kind of margins of the text. So this is like a cinematic reading of the page. So here we might think here too of why this might be related to a broader discourse of the commodity fetish, that we tend to think in typographical terms of the footnote as replicating a Victorian social practice of keeping the help out of the sight of uh, the text itself. So the academic habit of relegating notes to the foot of the page or the end of the book is a mirror of Victorian social practices of keeping labor out of the sight of the domestic interior. Um, yeah, and here there's another kind of discourse of free floatingness. If only we could return to the Renaissance where notes were permitted to move around in the margins of the text that could at the same time enrich the life of the page. I would argue in a way that we might think about um, the tidal zone or the littoral zone as one that is enriched by a movement around the margins between coast and um, ocean or land and sea. 